golf was my life, and uh, I didn't want to give it up. Uh, so I went to work. Hello and welcome to another episode of Making a Club Champion. I'm delighted to bring you a very special guest today on this episode, a gentleman called David Galbraith. David is a clinical psychologist specialising in both business and sporting performance. I was lucky enough to meet David for a gentleman called Matt Perry, who I travelled to the final stage of the European Tour last year with him in Spain, where I was his caddy. I was on his bag. That connection was all made possible through Laurie Cantor, both of which you can find their stories and their episodes on makingaclubchampion.com and I wouldn't miss them both. They are both fantastic. They dig into all sorts, life behind the scenes, what life is really like on tour and much, much more. I was so impressed by Matt and how he went about his business during that final stage and everything he did, I knew that someone was rubbing off on him and after a couple of probing questions one night at dinner, I discovered that that gentleman or one of those gentlemen were David. So, being based in New Zealand, some of David's achievements are the following. The Chiefs Super Rugby Team, the All Black Rugby Sevens Team, the New Zealand Women's Sevens Team, the New Zealand BMX Team, the New Zealand Women's Football Team, and the New Zealand Men's Golf Team. He is also author of the book Unleashing Greatness. We dive into what resilience is and how resilience on the golf course relates to resilience in life, how to focus on process rather than results, and how to build in habits for long term effectiveness. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy this episode and as they say in New Zealand, kia kaha, I hope you're all well and as ever, thank you so much for listening to uh, these episodes. It brings me great delight to bring them to you each month uh, and I hope you enjoy. David, welcome to the show. Thanks Chris. So for those who perhaps have not heard of you or perhaps don't know a little bit about what you do, I was wondering perhaps you could uh, intro yourself and perhaps tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah, something I get asked quite a bit actually is, you know, what do I do and who am I? Um, I guess start with formally, I'm a New Zealand registered clinical psychologist and have been for 17 years, but for the last 10 years I've been full-time uh, working in our elite sport. Underneath that, though, I'm still struggling to figure out what the hell a psychologist is after 17 years, and I often ref- probably still more consider myself a chaplain rather than anything else when I think about the dis- sorts of discussions I have with athletes and people and business people around the you know around the around the place. So, did you say did you say a chaplain? To describe it. Yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's the psychologist for me doesn't. I see other psychologists operate, and it doesn't feel like how I operate fits that model. <laughs> Because um, usually it's conversations that happen with people that allow them to shift in the way that they, the, I suppose, perspective and habits and those sorts of things happen through conversations. Um, so I'm often listening more than I'm talking. And it just feels like that's a really apt description about some of the stuff, that I guess, the spiritual connection that happens and the way people flow through the work we do. Um, so yeah, I, I, even though I'm formerly a psychologist and I'm practicing as a psychologist in New Zealand, it's that's not how I see you know, if, if someone was to ask me what my identity is defined by, it certainly wouldn't be defined by a psychology or being a psychologist, Interesting. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I've always wondered, like, um, especially for someone who, like, their, their job is a psychologist or you describe yourself as a chaplain, um, you, you obviously listen more than you talk. And perhaps mm. I'm, I'm wondering if, the, like, uh, I'm just thinking, like, the clients perhaps you work with, um, do, do their problems actually rub off on you in terms of um, because you're always sort of soaking in their problems or perhaps what, what they're trying to deal with? Uh, does that have a, like a negative effect on on your life, or if, if you understand what I mean? Or yeah, yeah, no, I certainly do. Um, I, I guess for people who work more in the probably the mental health side of things, that may be the case. And certainly, you know, if you're working with trauma, where I cut my teeth as a I guess a new psychologist, I was in that area. Um, the, probably the, the, the philosophy and approach I work, which is around people's potential and 
people expressing their genuine authenticity, the I, I come away incredibly buzzed. If anything, it's uh, ironically it inspires me to have to live my life the same way that I'm encouraging them to live theirs. So it's only real positive energy that flows off the work I do, and it's where every day I'm incredibly humble. Really, to, to think that I do what I do for a living because uh, it's not it's not an, it's not a job. Um, but I'm very fortunate, and it pays, you know, it pays my way and pays my family's way. So, I, yeah, it's, you know, I guess in the old days, I've been sacrificing a goat probably every day just to keep the keep the keep the universe happy with how good things are going because of the, the utter gift it feels like I get to to live every day and working with these people. Yeah, so it certainly it, it does rub off on me, and it rubs off in a really good way. That's interesting. It's such a positive energy. Why? Why do you? Is that because you're 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 working with athletes and they're they're aspiring to achieve like such great goals, or how what do you count that down for, down for or down to? Um, I think it's the goal that we're pursuing which generates the energy because I, you know there's probably the irony if we think about our connection through Matt. Um, I met Matt or oh, many years ago now when he was uh, probably a middle to late teenager maybe i think maybe a late teenager around 17 18 and just for for the listeners are of perhaps who don't know who matt is I, he's if you go on to making a club champion.com he was a chap i caddy for uh, over in spain in the final european tour qualifying school was a, one of fantastic interviews that which led me to david so um feel free to tune back in that but absolutely carry on yeah good connection yeah. good connection yeah um the goal with you know, I guess the goal that I'm chasing with all athletes, and even it's irrespective of they're whether an athlete or a a business person or a parent or a teacher. For me, that whatever they do is actually irrelevant because it's the process that's the key bit, and the goal inside that is uh, is not outcome. The goal is the for me, it's the it's the essence of identity and the person figuring that out, and then honouring that identity that they say. Um, exists for them and that's where the real buzz happens because usually in life people don't themselves um, like I reckon it's you know it's very sad that most people and I, this might sound like a generalization but 17 years as a psychologist when people come to have seen me historically before sport and also in sport if they're unhappy they're unhappy because they're not being themselves or they haven't found who they are and they aren't being themselves and are feeling like a fake or a fraud. They might be in relationships that they don't want to be in or pursuing jobs that they're unhappy with and they're just generally unhappy. And when you uncover that and explore that for them and help them see what that unhappiness is about, is it, it, it um, inevitably leads back to a discussion about how they don't feel they are honouring or being themselves. And so the work I'm doing, their sport, is just an op- is just the vehicle for them to express that, and so the buzz comes from them actually disconnecting from outcome. As ironical as that sounds, that like the athletes I work with are in our top, oh, I suppose our top percentile. That's my space I operate each day, even though they are that at that level in their own performance, um, it's still exactly the same. So for me, it's like it's the buzz comes off them recognizing that we create this. Um, reality or place around the importance of uh, outcome, of wealth, of status, of KPIs at the expense of the process of living true to who they may be. And then ironically, once you free up from that, well, then you're actually freeing up yourself to tap potential that you may not have even realized existed. So the buzz, I think, comes off them finding purity and then the buzz comes off them finding purity and performance, but from the bottom up, not top down. So they work at performance through being a human the human they are, and then the performance flows off that. So that that's where I think the buzz comes from in that space there, because it becomes quite electric. So I, I, I guess everyone like uh, tries to find these sort of uh, grand goals or grand uh, things they're working towards. But what? How, yeah. how, how does someone connect to, you know, as as, as you said, just them being pure, uh, just be yeah. like just being them, and like obviously that connects to just you like uh, actually just truly finding what you're what you're here to do so how does someone go about finding that i mean that's a problem i suffer with myself i'm sure with sure with many people yeah look it's a really good question because that's the underpinning i think to all the successful work in this space but i think also success in 
if you think traditional form of success in, in achieving what you're capable of in life is directly linked to. Um, there's a couple of key things I think the listeners can can do straight away, and it's you know there's so many people who talk about this out there, which I really enjoy because there's lots of people like-minded really in many ways. The the key question for me when you start to reflect on who you are as a person is uh, we're tapping a value base and for you know values and deeper beliefs about the way we are and the way the world operates and the way the people are. And you can ask some fundamental questions, which might be, you know, if you could choose three words that define your life, what would you, what are they or what would you like them to be? So, for example, you might say, well, charity, adventurism, and free spirit. That's my, what you might make, do some reflections and come up with those three terms and go, David, that's, that's what I think defines me. Or I'd love to have written on my tombstone when I die. Maybe let's say free spirit. So that that sort of question will start to tap into that space that you've will find uh, the clarity on those things. And then another one, I, which I think is very important to ask, is what needs to happen for you to go to, go to bed feeling happy at night. Um, Say, so even you think about golf, Chris, you could ask yourself what needs to happen for me to feel happy with a training session or in a round. And most golfers end up saying um, that I shoot 78 uh, roughly, um, break 80, for example, um, or break 70, um, that I have control over the ball, that I feel like um, I was able to play um, with control throughout the round. For example, they might say those things. So you can see how that's starting to give us an idea that that person's linked to outcome. And then that's another way of undercovering how we currently roll, where our identity currently um, exhibits itself at a deeper level. So you might have your values and how we, how we, or our belief around what needs to happen for us to feel successful is uncovering our um, expectations we have on ourselves around what success is. So you can start to ask those questions: what your values are, what needs to happen for you to feel successful, to get a bit of an idea about how you're currently existing, or. If you want to ask what I would like it to be, you can get some idea about what you're um, potentially going to move towards. And so I ask those two questions as we establish a bit of a foundation to the discussion. And the success question really helps people start to recognize whether they're someone who's motivated by outcome or they're motivated, motivated by the process of what they do. Or as I like to talk about it, whether they're motivated by icing um, rather than baking the cake itself and you know, so you could almost then start to link that to identity and go, hey, someone who's motivated by external motivation or internal motivation or status and ego versus um, self-pride. So you can start to get a bit of an idea about how you can go about that yourself. And in a very short time, you can have a bit of an, I guess, an ideology really of what you want to be living, which may be I want to live, I want to be a person who is charitable, a free spirit and incredibly adventurous Maybe. So there's an example of it. And I want to have success, um, which may be defined more by um, effort and attitude rather than outcome. So you might call it empty the tank, for example. So you've got a pretty strong representation of a person or a human being right there. So charity, free spirit, adventure, and success equals empty the tank. So, so in a very short time, you can have, have a construct that then – you essentially have to look in the mirror and ask yourself whether you're all shit or not, or you live that. And that's where you build your, build your rituals off that. So you can build rituals off those core values that then become, a, you know, it's not a structure. And I call it a ritual versus a habit because I think habits are often things that we almost have to force ourselves to do. Whereas a ritual for me is a very powerful habit that becomes a spiritually um, rewarding and rich place that when you do those things, it has massive ramifications on the way that you feel about yourself. So, so I sort of prefer the ritual over habit. So that's probably a little bit of a glimpse about how that stuff starts to roll out. But once you have that clarity, and now we've got some real meat to work with in our catch-ups, where again, where I become a listener and ask people to reflect on those things and prove to me that they're living those things and have evidence for living in that space. And from there, that's where the magic really happens. That's just that's a very very good answer. I think um, I was going to ask you a couple of questions within that, but I think you seem to have answered them. But um, so once once someone sort of would establish their their three words, uh, yeah, um, they can then they can put metrics within those 
uh, free words? Is is that right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if you even if you take a free spirit, if someone says I'm a free spirit of human being, David, I'll say that sounds like very exciting and lovely. What, what does that What does that mean, or how would I see it? Give me some examples about what I would see with you being a free spirit. And then for once they have that discussion, I'm actually encouraging them to build the very behavioral rituals that will come off that. So let's say they're free spirit, which means they get up before the sun comes up every day and do meditation in front of the sun as it, raise, you know, as it rises in the eastern sky. That would be an example of it because if that's what they say that represents for them, well, if they're not doing that, well, that's where the challenge is around their integrity. And so let's say but in a golfer's world, they might say, oh, I'm, I'm someone that really enjoys peaceful state of mind. Well, then I'd be saying, well, how the hell do you find peace? Show me peaceful state of mind before you tee off on the first hole of the club championships. Your peaceful state of mind doesn't exist usually for our golfers because they all look like robots. They all go and do exactly the same thing before they tee off in a tournament. They look exactly the same way. They, they, they are certainly not the person I spoke with during the week when I had a beer with them. They're completely different. And so we actually, that's where the challenge really starts to come is that we build those rituals and routines and then we move to places where the pressure comes on. Because ironically, if someone has deep, you know, a real a deep sense sense of maturity and a solid ego, when pressure comes, they embrace the moment because it's essentially the atmosphere increases everything, and so their values that they identified should then grow. So they should be more free spirited. They should be more adventurous. They should be more charitable. If they don't, then they are clearly not living to those values because the other values, whatever they might be, which could be careful and conservatism or selfishness. They're the ones that come to the fore. So it's in pressure we see people who they really are because that's what's actually happening is you can't hide in pressure. And the idea is I want people to embrace pressure too, so that's where it's perfect. The more pressure, the better. So I, I like if I was a student of yours, I think my next question would be, um, so we, we've defined these these three categories which I want to live by and then we build in these rituals yeah. uh, uh, or, or habits. Uh, so, we're, yeah. so we're living these three words and then I would – I think my natural question next would be, so where's this going? Like, what what's the end goal here of, oh, but or is that the process? And and that's when the process is more important than the end goal. What that would be my. Yeah, it's a very good question because a lot of people come and they want to do this stuff to, in order to gain something. They right. want to do these things that we're talking about to shoot sixty five. Right. So the golfers will come and say, I want to do mental skills or sports psychology because I want to play better, and I'll say, I'm going to refer you on. Because ironically, for me, that's the very reason why I don't want to work in that space with them is because they're actually pursuing something to get something and then they're automatically sabotaging their potential because it's become about um, it's become, become a gain. And this is where it becomes really fascinating because as soon as we start to chase something for a reason, it's no longer pure. So the love of doing what we do, so I guess it's this probably just steps into another space, which is a long sign identifying who we are as a person. There is a challenge about integrity around why we do what we do and who we're with. And so I'll work on two spaces, which is the relationships people have and then why they do what, they, what, what they're what they actually doing, so for a hobby, for a job, or for a sport. And essentially in that space, the challenge to them is to prove to me that they are genuinely in love with the person that they are with and that they genuinely love what they are doing. Because unless you have those two things, you're not going to access purity anyway because it's always bullshit. And you can, as far as I'm concerned, you can't access a pure purity as a human being if you're living a lie. Yeah. And so the challenge is to prove that, so for example, yourself, is do you prove that you love golf before we pursue golf to achieve anything? Because the you know the, the purpose in life, well, I guess I break it down quite simply, is to do good to the planet and really look after it properly so we pass it on to the next generation better than it was than when we had it, which we're doing a poor job of. And the second one is to actually um, pursue a passion. And so if we just take it to that space, before we even look at what the goals might be or the KPIs might be for the sport that people are, are participating in, I think there's some real fundamental stuff there to get to get aligned underneath. And so when we talk about what the goal would be that we're going to achieve by doing these things, or let's say golf to shoot a lower score, that's a KPI that will be a byproduct of you achieving your goals within the process. And if people want to set those, that's fine. But for me, it's about leaving it as a KPI and never making it the goal. So the goal isn't to shoot 65. Of course, it's a form of a goal. But I liken it to business where you set KPIs to make a certain amount of money. But the goal should be how you make the money, not the money itself. That should be the real buzz that drives the organization. And it should be the real buzz that drives a human being. And so the, the irony is that what we'll end up chasing and pursuing as a, um, as a, as a, like as a goal is 
I, I just call refer to it as purity. So we're chasing. So let's say we're saying that pre-shot routine in golf because it's a really nice concrete example to, to give it some to give it some um, sense of how this looks. Let's say the person says that they're someone who loves the real sense of adventure. Now that's quite an, for me that's quite an electric type feeling. So their pre-shot routine should have a real sense of electricness in it. If they say they're a really peaceful, free spirit, then the pre-shot routine should have a real sense of being a monk. It should be very deep and very meaningful and very peaceful and very quiet. And so what we'll set up is a purity rating. The purity just refers to whatever it is they describe that space should be. So if we take the monk space, the goal that we're actually pursuing is for them to achieve purity in that rating. I get a lot of golfers to keep, uh, or most golfers that, that do, you know, they'll choose that I work in their team or choose to work with me. they the stat that because a lot of them do shots to hole, or they'll keep these stats on performance, um, you know, fairways and regulations, etc. But they never keep a stat of the the um, the quality of the pre-shot routine or the quality of the spiritual space pre-shot. So I'll start them to keep that stat, and in the end have a um, shot by shot average for the round, which measures how pure did they get in their spiritualness, which might be in that case, let's just read something they call it relaxation. But for me, I always work at a deeper point. I go deeper than just them being relaxed. I want them to be, you know, I want them to be in touch with the universe in that space. Um, so the outcome that they'll get is that the further we go down this path, as they have a deeper connection to themselves, they're more authentic in who they are. I'm reading a book at the moment called The Secret Wisdoms of the Samurai, um, translated by a guy called Alexander Bennett. And one of the um, lovely quotes in there is that, or a little passage from, I think, around the 1600s, they have this, I think it's pronounced Kazemono, which essentially means, as an English translation, is quintessential weirdo. And they only gave that term to the very, very best samurai. So a Richie McCaw of rugby would have been given that term Kazemono because, because they are so different in the way that they live and the way they apply themselves and, I guess, their purity. They got given this term because no one else was like them. So it was a huge endearment or a sign of respect to be called that. And that's what I'm pursuing with the athletes I work with. I want them to be themselves so fully that people look at them and go, oh, my goodness, you are so weird. So pre a tournament round, the golfers should, and you know that's my challenge to them, is if they are truly being authentic, they will not look like anybody else because everyone else at the moment really don't know what they're trying to achieve. They think they're trying to, they are trying to achieve a good score but not play badly or make the cut or not miss the cut, whatever it might be. But that's just a program they run. They, they, they lose themselves in that space. There's, you can guarantee their unhappiness, the elation is short-lived. The, it's a very ugly spot. And sadly, most, or I guess generalization again, so I apologize for that, but it certainly looks like 99% of golfers head that way versus pursuing the other end of the spectrum, which is universally different. And so that becomes, I guess, if we just link that back to your question, the outcome is very... Um, authentic itself. I don't, you know, I work with the athlete, and I. So the irony is, after ten years in this space, I often giggle because I have very little regard for outcome. I love to see people empty the tank and apply themselves fully to a um, a passion or a dream or a vision or a, a love, and that for me gives me more of a buzz than the actual score or the outcome or whether they win a gold medal or not. Of course, you know, I enjoy a nice little cream cheese icing across a carrot cake in a good cafe. So I do like a little bit of icing too, but the, my most satisfaction and buzz comes from seeing people drop in, unleash, trust trust in the, the universe, I guess, or the process of what they're doing and just let go. And then that's the real KPI, or the, for me, the real goal that achieves the KPIs of the scores that they're after. So the real goal, if we put it that way, would be the goal of purity, the goal of letting go, the goal of unleashing, the goal of not thinking, the goal of instinctive release, mm -hmm. and then having a rating for that that they can keep shot by shot, hole by hole. And then really, when I've been there really humming, they make that their primary obsession. So people ask them afterwards, oh, how'd your round go? And they'll go, oh, man, you better get a chair and sit down because I've got a lot to talk to you about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I um I remember Matt in our interview. Um, I, I know you work with him. I asked him what's what's his grand vision or what's he working towards, and he said to win four majors in a year. Um, yeah. So I was I was gonna. How does someone attach or detach themselves from like the end result uh, within their three words? 
and yeah. and actually just get absorbed by the day and die out process and actually not get overwhelmed by this sort of grand vision perhaps where they may be going in the future yeah 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 no that's a really good question because it's i do you know <clears throat> the well obviously what matt's are touching on there is a concept called the impossible dream which is to create and hold to a belief around something that most people will tell you is impossible and this is this is i didn't just bring matt up as an example this yeah, is a yeah. problem i face uh, I, I set uh, quite big or high goals, and I, the problem I get is I, I get very overwhelmed by them, and actually, yes. what I, and this, the the knock on effect of that is actually I do nothing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The I, I guess the key in it, Chris, is that we become overwhelmed by them when we define, we make them what we uh, what success is. And I know it's a form of success, but this is this is the bit which we're touching on before about how we actually define what success is. Um, and most people do. They end up setting down these dreams or the vision or the, the KPIs, the various things that they'd like to tick off along the way. And they define success by the realizing or not realizing of those. So, so obviously, this, oh, sorry, the success is realizing of those dreams and the failure is not realizing them. And that, and that becomes the very thing that then locks us into them. And they become, you know, they become directly related to our identity. And then as soon as they're related to identity, whether we achieve that or not becomes a matter of life and death. And so the thought unconsciously in our minds about not achieving that becomes unacceptable, becomes so anticipatory painful, painful or anticipatory grief connected to that not happening, we become, oh, I guess, stifled by it. We become frozen in time. We procrastinate, put things off or, or, or habits of fear so that the key in that space is, I guess, what we talked about earlier is we've got to have a bit of a chat to ourselves about what, at the end of the day, success is and is not. Is that and sort the, of proning yeah. the bullshit factor? Correct. Yeah, if we think about the way the world is at the moment, I don't know how long it's going to take humanity to get there, but it's been based on, a, um, for me, a philosophy of economy. So everything that drives our world is based on the dollar and economy and numbers and I, I look around us and look at crime and poverty and the state of the, the um, climate and the environment and just think, what, what, why? What? It's not working. <laughs> right. It's just clearly not working. And so for me, it's the same in sport. The number of people that have mental health issues because they have success attached to an external thing, an outcome, what social media says about them, their status, their rating – that's you know for me that's the underpinning everyone's unhappiness because we've actually lost we've lost the, p the point when the point is not what people think about us but what we think about ourselves not what we achieve but what we internally become so everything has been externalized when the irony the irony the irony of it all is that the the way we get you know the way we get anchored in the day is we make the internal process the most important thing to us it's fine for us to want lovely things. I'm not, I don't have a thing against that at all. You know, it's nice to have a nice house and a nice couch and a and 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 some bits and pieces which make our life pleasurable. So that for me is absolutely fine. But it's the how we go about achieving those and the motivation to do that. You know, most people don't give away. Most people don't have a charitable bone in their body, even though they say they might be charitable. They don't give any way of their salary away. You know, they hold they hoard money. So for me, it's it's. The real um, indictment on us is that we get caught up in these big um, selfish spaces rather than realizing that the internal space, an internal focus at a pure level, and even though that might sound selfish, isn't it? it uh, I'm probably losing a little bit of sense there, but for me that's the key component of everything we do is that we, we disconnect. We, we find a space to be pure today by disconnecting by the future, by putting it in its place. It's important, but it's not that important. What's more important is the here and now and our connections with families, with friends, with ourselves, with doing the right thing in the day and then throwing in some golf practice and some training and a gym session. So now it's put in its place. So the golf no longer owns us. We, we actually put the golf in a part of the puzzle of our life. It follows, we hold it to the same rules and we make sure it understands it's not the most important thing in the world because it isn't. And that's what I love about the game of golf was it was designed in a way to replicate life. It, it's just so purely there in front of us. And if you play golf, then you've got an opportunity every time you pick up a golf club to ask yourself, well, how am I living? Because it's going to be reflected in how I'm playing. 
So I'm not sure whether that makes sense. It's a bit of a bit of a ramble. No, no, I think it absolutely does. Oh, good, good, good. Like, well, I, 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 it's it's obvious when you're like in the in the deep end or going through rough patches, where whatever it may be in life, it could be coming yes. coming out of a relationship, or it could be you know on the golf course, it could be in business. It's uh, it's really tough in those situations to really think clearly. It's almost like you have this brain fog uh, where you where you can't think or uh, yes. act act back into the process. So I'm guessing, how does someone go? Like, what questions may someone ask or to prone this? Like, um, I don't know you getting in the way of yourself. Uh, you may be feeling yes. lost or overwhelmed. How how do they just get back to like putting on their trainers or just going to the gym or? Yeah, well, I guess there's two things in there, and again, it comes back to our perspective and how we. I guess it. You probably hear a theme throughout this chat, which is around how we define success. It was in the first, but we talked about it. it was being in the probably big bit of this last part. Our perspective on life is is influenced by how we deeply define or what beliefs we hold to about what success is. It's it's an incredibly powerful framework within our mind. And so, for example, if most people again have success, as life should be comfortable. Life should work out um, you know, because we often see people get really upset with their misfortunes or woe is me. That tells me that they have an expectation that life should deliver to them. And and I really love you know I really love the concept that we we are owed nothing. We're, uh, I guess it's a gift for us to be alive, but we then have to earn the right to have a good life, and it's going to be work and toil and ups and downs. It's not going to be uh, it's not going to be all um, an ideology in plain sailing and the second level off that for me is that if we have that mindset and we also have the mindset that life is an opportunity to challenge myself and see who I am and what I've got then when adversity strikes um, let's say it's a business adversity it's a financial adversity uh, and I'm talking differently about grief even though at the same time the loss of a loved one and the grief that one feels off that for me, there's a, this is this deeper level, which is that's raw and real, and we allow ourselves to have that because that's an emotional thing. And so we sit with, the, and I guess that's probably where I think about the chaplain's role, is when people have grief, I let people have grief. When people have elation, I let them have elation because it's an emotional, spiritual experience. So I don't want to do anything with that, let it be. It's when we start thinking again that now that now we've shifted from an emotional space, now we're in a thinking space, our perspectives of the world will influence how we then operate off that as a behavior. If our framework is adversity is good, adversity is a place I will find myself, adversity is a place that I'll get to see myself, then we embrace that moment. And there are so many examples around us about people who have been at the bottom of the hole or and suffered terrible things and yet when you interact with them, you come away with an absolute sense of peacefulness and inspiration because of their perspective and their habits or their rituals. And so our mindset, our spiritual set, is the key the key indicator for me of resilience. And I don't even really use the word resilience very much because I think resilience is a byproduct of our spiritual set and how we operate. Um, so... Uh, ironically too we actually you know as we, we may touch on it today we'll do it I'll talk about it now just briefly is we actually or in the way that I operate is we set up adversity within the lives of the athletes and we welcome the what most people would refer to as the dark hole it no longer is a dark hole because when form drops away there's feelings with that which we just leave and let them be but then the opportunity is on their worst day can they be themselves and so it's almost like as ironical as that sounds, as we celebrate when adversity strikes, we clearly don't celebrate if it's a, you know if, if they, someone loses their mum, for example, or their dad. That, that, that's not what I'm saying. That that's real grief, and when we will grieve as long as that takes and be pure in that space. What I'm referring to is you know non non immediate um, significant other relationship gr- um, crisis. That's the stuff where, ironically, um, we should be getting most excited, we should be most energized, and we should be most focused because now this is life. This is what life is about. Is about Our life will be defined by how our character is represented in moments of crisis. That's what people remember about us. And that crisis can be as anything as um, having going double bogey, triple bogey, double bogey, bogey in the first four holes of a, a really important tournament or club champs. 
that moment you should be getting more excited and be a bigger smile on your face than when you started. And people you're playing with will be going, man, what's this guy about? And you'll be going, I, this is awesome. Now I'm, I'm nine over the card after five holes. This is why I play the game. So that imagine what that would be like. That, 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 that's why I just love the game of golf. It's just so special. You don't get it anywhere else. Maybe cricket, cricket and golf. Nothing holds us in the washing machine as long as a game of golf does. Four hours, can't escape. <laughs> You've got to finish it off. <laughs> you can't put it down and come back to it later. What about if you take the, you know, I, say if you're in a purple patch in golf and it's, when you have the off day, it's easy um, It's easy to readjust uh, and go back into form. But, you know, when you if you go into the real deep end of that and perhaps someone has lost a loved one, or, yes. or you know, has, has lost his business. How does someone during the real times of resilience, when actually that that could be a passage of time, maybe two years, five years, or ten years, to get mm. over something like that? How does that one uh, work on a day in day out basis to um, almost be that resilient type of them being five over through four holes in a club champs, and they're loving it because yeah. that, that's a real. Um, that's the real dark. Yeah, I think, those, I think those significant losses are really different, um, and and at the same time they are they are different, and at the same time they're the same thing, in the sense that, um, let's say we lose a significant other, one's perspective of this is the most terrible thing in the world. That I get that, that that would hold absolutely for me. And then we just breathe in that space and go, yes, that is. And then the second bit off the back of that is, well, I still now have a choice. So let's say, you know, like losses in her life, and yet she still would have been back the next day helping children that have no, you know, children that um, orphan children. So for me, it is still a real sense of the, the, the picture you hold about what life is about. And if we have life is about generosity and giving and caring for the planet, let's say we have a simple ritual off that, which is we pick up rubbish every day as half an hour's work in the morning before breakfast. Even in face of that loss, our challenges in that space, at some point we've got to breathe and resurface. And when we do resurface, well, then we should have our rituals that we go back to because it's about living, it's not about dying. And it's a, and again, it's please. I'm not making out that that's easy. It certainly won't be easy, especially if it's a significant loss of family. And that space beyond the um, the darkness of the immediate loss comes a time when well, we still have to do something. We still actually have to get up and um, take the kids to school, and we still have a place to go and work. So there's there's some things that come back into gear off the other side of that grief. And then that's where I'm talking about it's not – you may only have 10% of your spirit to give, but the challenge in that space is we'll then give 10%. Right. So we end up being in a place of not judgment but an expectation for us to honour what we do have rather than what we don't have and fulfil those commitments to ourselves and then others around us because then it's from the – and that's not a um, – it's from an inner-out philosophy which is about giving of self – to family, to friends, to our work colleagues. So it, it, I hope that starts to make sense as we may only be operating in a limited capacity, but then often often people give themselves, um, they create, they, the way people think about it often becomes the issue rather than the thing itself that created the space. So it's actually the way we think about the loss rather than the loss itself that then has a long-term follow-on effect that ironically becomes, you know, this may sound pretty harsh, but it, it becomes an excuse I, I, yeah. I've never thought of it in terms of uh, it could be even like you know if, say if you're on the golf course and you're only operating at 60% yeah well then uh, what you're saying there is like to to actually just squeeze every last drop out of that 60% and correct um, correct and actually when you're on you know your your purple day you're just flying and 100% it actually still you there's still probably of you can get even more out of that, you know, because uh, you still may just get 95% out of when you're set. Yes, 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 because yeah. ironically, if you can drop into that space, you may actually uncover that it was actually an illusion and that wasn't the case at all. Right. I think there was, yeah. Darren Clark used to, uh, I think may have got it from Rotella, but he, he would describe it as like green light and red light, so like a traffic light. Right. 
So okay. if he was, if he felt like it was a green day, you know, he felt like he could perhaps go after things a little more. But if it was a red day, he knew he was going to have to really work at it. And uh, um, yeah, but I, in terms of like a percentage, that's quite interesting because uh, I think the mm. the alternative to that is that we we actually just give up and don't do anything because correct, we, correct. we're kind of extremists. Yes, and I guess that the, the, the and that's fair for me. And this is probably where it's, it sounds probably less like a Chapman right now. But I'll just hold a mirror, in many respects, to people and say, "What are you learning about yourself now? That's possibly and more than likely been there before for a long time, mm-hmm. and that this crisis or this loss or this moment is just highlighting for us that you can now learn from." And you know, and this is said in the most loving, compassionate way: is you might not like the mirror, right? which for me is a fantastic place to get to is that we see ourselves in a raw and real way rather than the bullshit way that most society people, you know, society wants us to see ourselves and not to look at where we're not um, quite the finished product as a human being because it's from that place that we can grow and evolve, change and become, I believe, what, humans are supposed to be which is caring compassionate selfless people that also have a passion and a drive and a you know a um, competitiveness that that goes together beautifully in a way that allows a sport to flourish and then the winner and the loser is found and then at the end of that the person with a deep very sense stable stable sense of who they are will go across to the person that bet them and shake their hand and genuinely appreciate their moment and then that's once we get to that place, doesn't mean to say we don't hurt, we'll still hurt, but then to have the capacity to be decent, um, rich, and other people's success and that sense of abundance that then we've found, I reckon, probably what most people search for their entire lives but never have any idea how to get, we find that purity. And then that's the, you know, like in many ways, the it's a terrible thing to think, but there is a gift in all adversity. For me, again, I just make it a little reference though on that, that if we lose a child or a family member, that's, I don't agree with that, but that's just, that's just sometimes just, just really unlucky and horrible. So I guess I'm referring to the other challenges in life. Mm. My college coach in uh, North Carolina, he was, uh, was from Stanford and he came over and worked with us and, he would always tell us at actually the end of most of his talks, he would always say, you are, you know, we always thought he was just quoting a Michael Jackson song, but I don't think many of us understood what he meant, but he was always, <laughs> he used to always say, you are the man in the mirror. Man yeah, um, in the mirror, yeah. But I, I do you know, I, I never, you know, when things, a coach could say something, you just, it just goes over, you don't get it. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't, I personally didn't get that. It didn't strike a chord with me and perhaps I didn't, perhaps I didn't want to look, in the mirror and, and see what yeah. I saw. And that may yeah. have been it. I was hiding and uh, perhaps it's maybe start unra- unraveling maybe a couple of years later. I don't. Yeah. 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 That's no, a good way to refer. It's a good way to look at it because most people in the world are hiding. It's a very small, it's a very small percentage of people who genuinely seek feedback about their character and the way they're interfacing with others in the world in order to, to find personal growth at that very raw level because um, it is it's that's a really raw place to go to and yet sport that's what i love about sport is sport and doesn't matter whether it's a club golfer or a, on the pga tour you can't hide you get to see who you are you go double bogey or go birdie pa 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 let's say you're on a 10 handicap and you start out one day on fire like that we will see what sort of person you are right then. Just as we will if you go triple, double, double when you're on a two. We will see. And that's the greatest thing about the game, is it? An elite sport especially, but I think golf for anybody um, gives, them a, gives them an automatic um, opportunity to see inside themselves and how their mind and spirit are, are wired. Mm-hmm. Which are pretty cool bars, really, just from a game. Yeah, absolutely. How how does um how does someone look themselves in the mirror and, and actually prone past all the bullshit? Yeah, um, if, let's say you're married and you've got three kids, and the kids are nine, twelve, and thirteen, because a pretty standard, you know, middle aged golfer. Um, you would ask the wife to go and ask the children without them knowing that you've asked that to ask to describe their dad. Mm-hmm. 
or you ask your auntie, you you might ask your brother or sister to go and ask your children, can you describe your dad? So I, I so I, before I was a sports psychologist, I worked. We called it social services here, which is we, um, I guess, our services that are put together work with the police to help kids um, keep keep kids safe. And so we would. Uh, my job was assessing parents who abuse children and assessing children for their safety to be living with their parents. And I'd often ask, you know, I'd just ask the, you know, the kids um, between the ages of probably seven and twelve. I'd say, "Can you describe your dad for me, please, in one word?" And as powerful as this sounds, they would go, uh, you know, like monster, for example. And that defines them straight away. So you can, we can follow that same process by asking people to ask others about us without them knowing that we've asked. And you will get feedback, which will give you an idea about who you are as a person. But that's a very brave, very, very brave place to go to. But that's how we can look in the mirror. Because when we, 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 we humans lie, we bullshit ourselves. So you can ask people to ask others to give you feedback, or you can yourself actually sit down and go, right, I'm going to do this without. Um, any bullshit and actually start to ask myself how do I think I'm going how much time do I give each week so let's say you've got, you're a parent well, how much time do you give each week to your children it might not be the same because you've got to work so the, the quantity may not be the same but the real challenge is well, what's the quality of time like I had a ter- terrible stat and I'm pretty sure it was New Zealand dads where they looked at how much quality time a father spent with their children each day four and a half minutes right yeah but he, just think, he probably thought he probably thought an hour or something like that. Yeah, he's probably thinking he's you know he's probably done a lot of time. It's just you know like I guess it's you know it might be a mum as well because mums and dads work now. It might be a bit of an older stat, but you know I often look at a lot of parents want to go and you know I don't play golf because I can't I can't find a way that I can say oh, I'm going to take four hours out of my day with my away from my two daughters. But it doesn't mean to say that you're extreme and don't do that. You might find different ways to do it, but it's the real challenge. However, you tick to actually sit back and go, how much time do I spend in each place? Because that'll give you an objective reality check. Asking others what they think, asking others to ask others about you will give you another objective reality check. So I think those are some of the things you can do or you can sit down as well or have a cup of tea and just actually go, right, I'm going to start to reflect on what sort of person I am. Do you say, you mentioned mm. that uh, when you ask someone, that you actually have to ask someone to then ask someone else. Is that yeah. right? You can't just yeah, directly you, ask. Yeah. If you directly ask them, you're going to get a uh, modified Bush. version. You get the yeah, Australian yeah, soft, yeah. yeah, soft. Yeah. And you have to ask, uh, get them to ask people who actually they respect that or know that you know if there's respect there or someone close or does it not have to be someone? Yeah, close? The, yeah. It's an interesting one. You do you know maybe give it a little bit of thought, but sometimes our greatest adversaries will give us the most accurate view of ourselves. <laughs> but but. That's not saying you go and ask a prick who's been um, nasty in your life to give you feedback because that's just silly. But you, but you might go and ask an uh, opponent business. You know, some here might go and ask another CEO of another company to, to give you feedback uh, because they may be better. You know, just it's, so it's just it's obviously you give that you, you give that a bit of sensible consideration. Yeah. Well, I suppose if you're on a, a holiday with a, say a bunch of people, you could probably. Ask someone within that holiday, he's like, "What did Thingy think of me?" And that would probably yes. give, that would probably Correct. give you a good, uh, yeah, yeah, a, absolutely, a good sort of uh, yeah. insight. Yeah, um, and then if you know who, and then if you, you're asking for that feedback, but you're also making it in reference to what we started off this you know podcast talking about, which was defining who you are as a person. That's another way that you can keep giving yourself feedback across time about whether you're on track with those three things or the yeah. four or five things you define yourself by. Interesting. Fantastic. Mm. I want to be respectful of your time, David. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic so far. Um, but I'll, so, I'll ask you some sort of rapid fire questions and uh, yeah. just uh, get close to wrap up. So, um, yeah. your favorite book or favorite books? I know you've touched on a couple, perhaps which even mm. you can maybe give to your clients. I know you have a book of your own. Uh, okay. My favorite author would be um, David Gemmell. David, okay. So, he's a um, heroic fantasy writer. Okay. And I believe he was expelled from school at 15, was a boxer bouncer. Someone picked up his notes that he used to rush write for fun and said, man, you should get these published, and went on to become the greatest heroic fantasy writer of all time. What, what sort yeah. of books have he written? So um, well, you, the, the one he started with was Just the Legend. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, but he's a British British writer. So he's written about 31 novels. So he's got the Reganti series, um, Swords of Night and Day, White Wolf. Um, yeah, so there's a, you'll find him, he's very, very popular. And he writes about the human struggle. Uh, he, amazing character. So he'll study Sparta, for example, or Greece. I've never heard of it. I'll have to, I'll have to. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So a homeland from the own homeland. Um, but he, he unfortunately passed away at 59. So we've really lost a wonderful author in his prime. Okay. Um, but yeah, just outstanding. So he'd probably be my favorite author. Wonderful. And any any others that come to mind? Um, I'll put all of these in the show notes for people to pick up on as well. I've really, I've, there's a couple of podcasts. I really enjoy the podcast. Um, by David Goggins, or of David Goggins, I think it was Michael Gervais, or I can't pronounce his last name. So he's a wonderful podcast of a guy, David Goggins, who's the only man ever to be in, I think, Navy SEALs, Desert Rangers, and Air Force Special Ops. Okay. And it's a very raw um, interview, but that was probably profound. I found that quite profound. Um, That's a specific yeah, interview, I don't, I don't, is it? Yeah, I don't do a lot of reading. Um, I do more listening and process reflections. If, if you like that one, there's a there's a guy called Jocko Willink, um, okay. which you you may like. He was a U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, okay. Oh yes, I think I've seen some of his. He owns. Uh, he did a wrote a book called Extreme Ownership. Uh, yes. Yeah, you may yes, like that. Him. And I think you touched on the, the, the samurai book as well. I just ordered a book called it's called the the Book of Five Rings. Yes. Haven't read it, but. Um, <laughs> that's around the um the um super bowl yeah it's about a worry it? just he, he writes about um like philosophy of battle okay. and how oh. he, and how he went into battle and it's supposed to be a bit like meditations um seneca but uh it i flick it oh, yeah. through and it looks it that's, looks pretty sturdy awesome. yeah um you got you got a hundred dollars uh to recommend to a guest or um uh, or best mate, how would you best likely spend it? It could be on the golf course. I know we haven't actually touched much on golf this evening, but it's all relatable. But how would you best uh, advise them to spend it in return of their investment? Oh, I'd go. I'd walk down the main street of any city and find a couple of homeless people and go and shout them dinner and sit down with them and hear their story. Right. Yep. Have you have you ever done that, or is that? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I try and find everywhere I can. I try and find a way to buy people food rather than give them money, and then just to have a chat with them. Yeah. What any interesting stories have come up? Oh, from? most most of them are sad stories, but some of them too. You know, like just the perspectives of life for me uh, is just, you know, it's just makes me incredibly grateful for what I've got rather than not focusing on focusing on what I haven't got. Mm. Mm. I've never done that, but I've always I have I have. Uh, I generally, if I was someone else, I'd generally buy them something. But yeah, but it's more of a time thing. It's actually, it's probably even yeah, more, yeah. more important to them than a. Yeah, it might even be just a coffee. It doesn't have to be a feed. It can be, you know, coffee and a muffin or something. Yeah. But actually sitting down and. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. We we do an action challenge uh, that each week we ask a guest to give an action. That's something that our listeners can uh, do a drill exercise or reading that's sort of related to in your field of expertise. Um, mm. So far away. Cool. Um, if if you're someone that looks in the mirror six or seven times before you go to work, making sure you're looking handsome or pretty, then one one day without doing any looking in the mirror, shower, get dressed, and go to work. So you but you do sort of a, a sort of a, a good look for a while, and then you you don't do it. Is oh, that... the, yeah. Well, the, the the thing is, it's um the biggest block that I have found in people's lives is fear of judgment and fear of what people think about them. Mm-hmm. And so performance is directly related to people, what people think about them, and then the fear of judgment, and then the fear of rejection. Okay. And so we spend more time thinking about what other people are thinking about when we have conversations with them, or trying to find a way to be the next person to win the argument, or have the smartest thing to say, because that will then make us look good. We never connect with people. We actually never genuinely um, be there in that moment. Mm-hmm. And so our biggest challenge in life is we we need to peel that away, and we can only peel that away by doing the very opposite to the thing that um, we do to be um, judged well. And so it doesn't mean to say that you know, like you can take that extreme and not shower at all and go to go to work looking absolutely rough and raw. Yeah. Now that's the that's the extreme of the challenge. Obviously, it has to you know because then you start to think, well, there's some context you have to take into consideration. That might be a law firm, for example. Right. Um, but I'm, a, I'm challenging people to actually look at the habits that they do because if, it, if it's the mirror looking, I would even look once 
Because if you have a shower, you wash, you put on, you know, your, your reasonable work clothes that fit the etiquette of the space that you work in, mm-hmm. that should be enough. Okay. If you're now looking, if you're looking, you are now moving back to a place of needing to look a certain way yeah, for the judgment component. So that's so that's a really basic challenge you can set up every day. And then the crazy thing is if you could achieve that, the shift it would make internally for you as a person and the amount of peace that you'd get off it would be colossal. So I think I actually misheard you. So it's actually not to look in the mirror. Not to look, not to look. In the first yeah. thing in the world. Okay, interesting. Mm. That's definitely a good one, I think, which... which uh, our listeners can definitely try. Um, <laughs> David, I don't. Um, I, I've never asked this to uh, interview, but do you, uh, do you have any questions for me on my end? Um, and you don't have to answer that. <laughs> you can literally yeah, just say it, no. <laughs> I, I guess the the, the the key bit is that the un, the the underlying. I guess for me is the your motivation for the podcast. What what's the what's the what's behind that for you? Like what is the, what's the vision that you're fulfilling or what yeah? What what is the how does what does this vehicle of the podcast set out to achieve for you, for yourself? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I've I've I think I've always when I was at college, golf in America, yeah. or if I was um, growing up when I was like sort of twelve, thirteen, when I first got into golf, I was always extremely interested in. Uh, I, I I felt this this weird time relation with golf in terms of I felt like every like I was surrounded by lots of great golfers growing up who play on the tour on the European tour now it's just I was in a little hot spot I I could say like Chris Wood um Laurie Cantor uh Chris Lloyd uh these are all sort of uh little characters who who, have done well on tour and they've they've pushed themselves and I think I was always so interested of like we've all got the same time I never felt yeah. like someone. I didn't really believe in the whole talent thing. But I was like, I wonder how he's practicing, or I wonder what his day in day out is, what he's doing differently to I am to make him yes. that little bit better than me each week. And I used to keep these little journals and, and notebooks, and I, I really got, I think, involved in the process of of golf, and uh, I think that was the most beautiful thing. Okay. I think as as I got older, though, it definitely turn into an external motivation. So like, um, like winning and, uh, you know, getting a scholarship to America, it was more like goal oriented. And I think I lost path. Yes. Um, but even when I was, uh, I, I remember my college coach and when I landed in America, he said, what, what's everyone here for? And I said to win trophies. Um, so, and everyone mm-hmm. laughed, but so I think my, my, I shifted in motion, but when I was out in the States, I was always constantly speaking to um, maybe people back home, or my coaches or other tour players and asking them and reaching out to individuals and asking them what they were doing on a day-to-day basis. Um, so I think uh, amongst being lost, I think my roots were very much um, how do people best perform and how they go about what they, how they do what they do. And uh, I think I'm tapping maybe back into that by hopefully sharing um, this knowledge by interviewing yeah. uh, top performers in the field of golf like yourself. Nice. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. But That's a cool little story. Yeah. Again, like I, I have had no real goals for this or anything like that. It's more just uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, just enjoying it, I think. It's because you love it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where mm. it's going to go. I have no idea. Um, mm. Oh, well done. But we'll see. Yeah. yeah um, awesome. Dave, I don't know where, um, if you want to have any last shout outs, uh, where people can find you or follow you on the internet, uh, any, any websites or social media. Oh, yeah, I try not to do that actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're busy enough as it is. <laughs> probably yeah, you're very yeah, time yeah, consuming yeah. actually. It probably distracts you from what you do, but mm, mm. you have a website right. though, is it right? Unleashing greatness within. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's a, um, there is a website that's there for people to have been able to access the book. Yeah. Uh, but even that's you know, all the books have oh, all the books have gone. So I'm sort of thinking now I need to reprint. Um, oh, you sold them all. Yeah. So it's, I think yeah that, that they've gone out there, which has been fantastic. Um, so no one can perhaps be so they can go to pathway. There's, there's a pathway one foundation, which is probably the that's the space where the book sits because uh, we try and plant trees and um, do mentoring. Okay. 
Uh, so they can access that site, um, and then that will probably lead them. Yeah, they can just follow their nose here from there. And is that just pathway one uh, dot pathway? Yeah, pathway one, uh, pathway number one foundation dot co dot nz. Okay, I will find it and I'll put it in the show yeah. notes for everyone to uh, to have a listen. Cool, um, David. Okay. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Um, I'd maybe thank love Chris. to do round two, maybe in the future. Um, yeah. But let's let's keep yeah, in touch. Thanks. Yeah, and lovely connection through Matt because um, he's a top bloke. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you got yourself a hell of a student there. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Awesome. All right. David, thank you so Thanks, much Chris. again. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks again for listening to Making A Club Champion podcast. If you love the show, don't forget to leave a review. If you want to take immediate action on what you just learned, head over to www.makingaclubchampion.com where you'll receive your own personal action challenges from the latest guests, all of the show notes, strategic philosophies, and much, much more. If you want even more from the show, head over to Instagram at Making a Club Champion, where you'll receive lots of golden nuggets and gems and goodies. Until next time, thanks for listening.